Welcome, everyone. It is my pleasure to be introducing our guest today. Along with my colleague, Professor Italia Omer, I will be in conversation with our esteemed panelists. This event is being hosted by the Religion, Conflict, and Peace Initiative at Religion and Public Life at the Harvard Divinity School and is co-sponsored by the Center for Middle Eastern Studies at Harvard University. The Religion, Conflict, and Peace Initiative centralizes an analysis of structural injustice, violence, and power and examines how a more capacious understanding of religion can yield fresh insights into contemporary challenges and opportunities for just peace building. I will now uh, introduce our speakers. Nadia Abu El Haj is a professor in the Department of Anthropology at Barnard College in Columbia University and co director of the Center for Palestine Studies at Columbia. She is the author of numerous journal articles published on topics ranging from the history of archaeology in Palestine to the question of race and genomics today. Professor Abu El Haj has published two books, Facts on the Ground, Archaeological Practice and Territorial Self-Fashioning in Israeli Society, published in 2001, which won the Albert Harani Annual Book Award from the Middle East Studies Association a year later and the Ge Genealogical Science, The Search for Jewish Origins and the Politics of Epistemology, published in 2012. While Professor Abu Hajj's two books to date have focused on historical sciences, her third book, tentatively entitled Soldier Trauma, The Obligations of Citizenship and the Forever Wars, forthcoming from Verso, examines the field of military psychiatry and explores the complex ethical and political implications of shifting psychiatric and public understandings of the trauma of American soldiers. Seth Anziska is the Mohammed S. Farsi Polanski Associate Professor of Jewish Muslim Relations at University College London. His research and teaching focuses on Israeli and Palestinian society and culture, modern Middle Eastern history, and contemporary Arab and Jewish politics. He is the author of Preventing Palestine, a political history from Camp David to Oslo, which was published in 2018 by Princeton University Press, and which was awarded the British Association for Jewish Studies Book Prize in 2019. His writing has appeared in the New York Times, the New York Review of Books, and Foreign Policy. Professor Anziska was a 2018 to 19 Fulbright Scholar at the Norwegian Nobel Institute and has held visiting professorships at Dartmouth College, New York University, the London School of Economics, and the American University of Beirut. Laura Friedman is the president of the Foundation for Middle East Peace. With more than 25 years working in the Middle East foreign policy arena, Lara is a leading authority on US foreign policy in the Middle East, with particular expertise on the Israeli-Arab conflict, Israeli settlements, Jerusalem, and the role of the US Congress. In addition to her work at FMEP, Lara is a contributing writer at Jewish Currents and a non-resident fellow at the US Middle East Project. Prior to joining the Foundation for Middle East Peace, Lara was the Director of Policy and Government Relations at Americans for Peace Now, and before that, she was a US Foreign Service officer serving in Jerusalem, Washington, Tunis, and Beirut. Our last speaker, Brian Klug, is a senior research fellow in philosophy at St. Bennett's Hall, Oxford, and a member of the Faculty of Philosophy at Oxford University. In much of his work, Dr. Klug addresses the messiness of our talk about race, ethnicity, and religion, with an eye to questions about justice, human rights, and political belonging. He, is, he has, excuse me, a special focus on Judaism, including Zionism and anti-Semitism, not least in the context of Arab-Jewish relations and the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Drawing on resources within Judaism itself, his work takes philosophy across disciplinary boundaries into neighboring fields in the humanities and social sciences. All this is reflected in his writing, his teaching, and his public speaking, and connects with his political activism. Dr. Klug, Klug helped draft and is one of the signatories of the Jerusalem Declaration on Anti-Semitism. Okay then, Professor Omar, the floor is yours. Thank you, Sarah. 
um, greetings. And uh, so um, as uh, Dr. Roy mentioned, my name is Atalia Omer. I'm a professor of religion, conflict and, and peace studies at the University of Notre Dame's Koch Institute for International Peace Studies. And I'm also a senior fellow with the Religion, Conflict and Peace Initiative, which is one of the co-sponsoring units of this event. Uh, before I say a few introductory and framing words about the session that we are about uh, to have here, I wanted to acknowledge my presence here in South Bend, Indiana at the University of Notre Dame on the traditional homelands of native peoples, particularly the Pokegan Potawatomi, who have been using this land for education for thousands of years and conti continue to do so. Okay, so the recent Jerusalem <clears throat> Declaration on Anti-Semitism or JDA as it's referred to here, interprets itself as an alternative to the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, IRA, or IHRA's working definition on anti-Semitism. IRA is promoted internationally as the presumed outcome of a consensus of experts. This characterization may be misleading. Indeed, it is the JDA that was endorsed by scholars of anti-Semitism, uh, Jewish studies, Holocaust studies, and Middle East studies, as well as other Jewish and Israeli public intellectuals. The JDA challenges the politicization of anti-Semitism, which is a part of IRA's legacy. It does so by re-articulating what is and is not anti-Semitism. The panelists, as our promotional material indicated, will reflect on the JDA's strengths, weaknesses, and silences, illuminating pathways for productive reassessment. Where the silences is one of our key questions. By silences, we refer primarily to the experiences of Palestinians vis-a-vis -vis IRA, IRA's rendering of a challenge to a zero-sum claims for Jewish self-determination as anti-Semitic in flavor, and any criticism of Israel as, at the very least, a potential flirt with anti-Semitism. By silence, silences, we also think in terms of overlooking the convergences between white supremacist violence and exclusionary politics, which often comes in the form of Zionist, Zionist anti-Semitism. For example, Richard Spencer, one of the ideologues of American white nationalism, in an interview for an Israeli TV station in 2017, referred to his own nationalism in terms of white Zionism, nevertheless suggesting that Jews have no room in his imagined political community. The lack of our focus on such self-evidently anti-Semitic expressions and the very real violence it inspires in places such as the Free of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh in 2018, on the one hand, and the muzzling effects of IRA and its various antecedent variations on advocacy of Palestinian rights is where we all are recognizing that defining anti-Semitism anti as a political impetus, and we aspire to interrogate it centering an anti-racist imperative. Not only a political uh, impetus, of course, we are also talking about political ramifications, especially for those who live under military occupation and are therefore directly affected by this politics of defining anti-Semitism. This conversation is then about the politics of defining anti-Semitism. The big picture questions guiding the conversation include, are certainly not restricted to, why does anti-Semitism need its own definition? To what degree, despite the JDA's acknowledgement that the fight for anti-Semitism is not disconnected from other anti-racism struggles, it nonetheless reproduces in its content a form of exceptionalism. Why is the process and act of producing a working definition political? When and where did the politics of defining anti-Semitism as a tool of censorship and smearing individuals, indiv individuals primarily involved with Palestine advocacy begin and why? What is the relevance of the boycott, divestment and sanctions campaigns to this story? Whose politics does the politics of definition promote? And as I noted, who and what does it attempt to silence or downplay? how to differentiate between weaponized anti-Semitism or false accusations of anti-Semitism and real anti-Semitism and between Israel and Jews and to what degree has the politics of defining and now redefining in the form of the JDA and other alternatives entrenched whether we want it or not any discussion of anti-Jewish hostility and racism in the politics of a particular nation state. 
Should we disentangle the two conversations of Palestine-Israel on the one hand and anti-Semitism on the other? So with the hope of illuminating those interrelated questions and issues, we gathered today with this esteemed panel of experts and interlocutors. With this framing in mind, let us proceed. As, and so the first round of questions will aim to get some basics on the table, but already move beyond the basics to analysis and substantive engagement, as well as allow the panelists to share their uh, perspectives on the JDA and related conversations. So uh, with this, I'll turn to, um, to Dr. Roy to launch us into the discussion and we welcome the audience to uh, submit questions as we go along and we'll try, uh, we'll do our best to thread them into our conversation. Okay, thank you, uh, Atalia. All right, uh, our first question uh, will be for you, uh, uh, Dr. Klug. And um, I actually have three questions and you should feel free to answer any or all of them. Um, the first is, how did the need for the JDA emerge? How does it diverge from the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance's definition? And why does anti-Semitism need its own definition? Right? Right. Thank you for that introduction. Um, and the first thing I want to say is that I'm so glad that this meeting is taking place because this is the best possible engagement that I can think of with the uh, work that those of us who produce the JDA um, have put, put into it. Um, the, the set of questions that um, Atalia read out earlier and um, three of which you've just um, reiterated, Sarah, Sarah um, are spot on. And, and, and they call for a thoughtful engagement with the issues that lie under the surface of what we're doing. But what I'm going to do in this initial answer is stick to the surface. I'm not going to go very deep because I want to try and set out the terrain and later in the conversation um, maybe we can probe more deeply under the surface. So I'm going to be sticking mainly to headlines and I'm going to be answering uh, I think all three of your questions up to a point, Sarah, I'm not sure. Um, one other thing I want to say before I start is that I am speaking in a personal capacity. I'm not speaking for the whole of the drafting and organizing group in the JDA. I'm only speaking for myself. However, I suspect that some, if not much, of what I'm about to say uh, does also reflect the way um, my colleagues within the JDA project uh, feel and think. So for me, the JDA is fundamentally an attempt to stop a runaway train. And that runaway train is the IHRA definition, working definition of anti-Semitism that um, the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, to give them their full name, produced in 2016. So it's a train that's been gaining momentum uh, for five years. At this point, it's been adopted very widely by, uh, for example, it's been endorsed by the Secretary General of the UN, adopted by governments, political parties, public agencies, universities, and other bodies, and the European Parliament has called upon all member states to adopt the definition. Um, I'll leave it at that, but there's a lot more to be said about the extent to which it has gained traction over the last five years. And during this time, it has also generated confusion, especially within the arena of debate and political action concerning Palestine and Israel. Secondly, and related to that, it has been instrumentalized. The IHRA definition has been instrumentalized to advance a partisan political agenda. Whether or to what extent that was the intention of the original drafters is another, is another issue. I'm only talking here about the effect, the impact, um, not necessarily about motive or intention. And thirdly, as a result, it has divided the fight against anti-Semitism at a time when anti-Semitism is on the rise. All of this is due to deep flaws within the document itself, within the IHRA definition. And yet no amount of reasoned critique over the last five years has stopped this train. And I say that with some feeling, having tried my hand in writing and in speaking, at pointing out in a reasoned way what those flaws are, but it doesn't seem to make any difference. 
the train just keeps running along down the tracks. And therefore, I think a number of us felt it's time to try something different. The success of the IHRA definition apparently is due partly to the absence of a viable alternative. That is something that a lot of parties have said when they have been uh, confronted with challenges to the IHRA definition, but they've proceeded to adopt it, often in good faith, I think, though they may not have read it, but feeling that, well, there's nothing else around and we ought to say something about the importance of fighting anti-Semitism. So, the absence of an alternative became so stark that uh, I think it motivated, perhaps there are other reasons as well, but that was one of the prime motivations for producing the JDA. Um, the, 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 the runaway, let me go beyond that, because the runaway IHRA train runs along tracks that are laid down in the name of Jews and Jewish interests, in other words, in our collective name as Jews. And therefore, in that same collective name, we set out to derail the train. In short, the JDA came about to meet two needs. First, the need for a superior tool for combating, combating anti-Semitism while protecting legitimate political speech and action, especially in connection with Palestine and Israel and Zionism. And secondly, to be an authoritative largely Jewish rejection of the idea that the IHRA definition speaks for us as Jews. So well, that's my answer to the question, why the JDA? I'll pause, Sarah, in case you want me to stop altogether, or I can continue to say something, and it'll be even briefer, about how the JDA is different from the IHRA. Please continue, Brian. Okay, thank you. Well, I will, I will again only be giving some headlines here. The IHRA website says, and I quote, in order to combat anti-Semitism effectively, it is important to have clarity about what anti-Semitism is and how it may manifest itself. But clarity, unfortunately, is precisely what their text lacks. Uh, the core definition, um, I've got it in front of me here, consists of two sentences. The first one says, anti-Semitism is a certain perception of Jews which may be expressed as hatred towards Jews. And to quote Professor David Feldman, who's director of the um, Institute uh, for the Study of Antisemitism at Birkbeck University of London, this is bewilderingly imprecise. The second sentence I think is even more confusing, but I'm going to move on, we can come back to that. Because politically, the main problem with the text is with their 11 examples that are attached to the core definition, seven of which are about Palestine and Israel. Now, people of goodwill look to that definition, the IHRA definition, for guidance concerning a key question. When should political speech and action about Israel, Palestine, and Zionism be protected? And when does it cross the line into anti Semitism? It's a proper question for people to ask, and people want clarity. And what they get instead when they read the IHRA definition as I put it in a recent essay in The Nation, is a matzah pudding. It's a mess. The JDA guidelines, in contrast, are intended to equip people to judge particular cases for themselves. Concerning uh, Palestine Israel, unlike the IHRA, the JDA gives explicit guidance about examples that, on the face of it, are not anti Semitic, and that includes. Um, differing political views about constitutional arrangements within the territory covered by Israel-Palestine in the future. So that's whether it's two states, one state, a binational state, a unitary state, a federation, all of that on the face of it, in and of itself, is not anti-Semitic. Or making historical comparisons, whether they involve settler colonialism or apartheid, not anti-Semitic, or pursuing in itself, or pursuing actions like boycotts, sanctions, and divestment. Now, what we're saying in the JDA is not that not, we're not endorsing any of these positions. What we're saying is that they are political questions that need to be argued about as political questions, and that in and of themselves, none of the things that I've just mentioned and others like them are 
anti-Semitic. Now, as well as lacking clarity, the IHRA definition lacks breadth. It separates out the fight against anti-Semitism from uh, any other context. And so, in contrast, our preamble invokes universal texts, such as the 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And we say in the preamble, and I quote, we hold that while anti-Semitism has certain distinctive features, the fight against it is inseparable from the overall fight against all forms of ethnic, cultural, religious, and gender discrimination. This perspective is absent from the IHRA text. But let me finish by saying, no definition can do what only people can do individually and collectively. That's to say, make judgments about particular cases. What we've tried to do with the JDA is to give people an aid to help them, to help us judge for ourselves. Thank you, Brian, uh, for getting us started with this. Uh, so the next question um, is to um, uh, Seth, I, um, from Cape Town. Um, can you speak to your involvement with the JDA? Uh, when and where did the politics of anti-Semitism begin? By whom? Can you also speak, um, if you want, um, of the decision to include only Jewish and Israeli signatories in the JDA? Why, why not include Palestinians as signatories? And how might it relate or not to the Palestinian call for, call for BDS? So as in the case of Brian, a multifaceted question. Well, thank you so much, Atalia, and all of you for inviting me to this important conversation. And I want to preface my remarks building a bit on what Brian said by maybe distinguishing a bit between practitioners and the way they're thinking about these questions and those of us who teach in university spaces, which is part of where I come at all of this from. And I think there's a, a way in which some of the background and the genealogy of the IHRA, which emerged at a particular time in a particular context, largely driven by practitioners, uh, was very much uh, at odds with the ways in which educators or scholars who are in classrooms or spaces where debates around Israel and Palestine, for example, often intersect with the politics of anti-Semitism because of the conjunctural moment that we're living in. And I think what you're seeing in the broader context of where these debates have now erupted is a kind of collision between a practitioner's approach and uh, the approach of those of us who study or teach uh, these issues. And maybe I'll illustrate that a little bit with a, a kind of example of how I came to all of this in my own experience uh, at UCL where I teach in London and I teach on Israel and Palestine. Uh, and the modern Middle East. And in the summer of 2019, I was asked to look into an exhibit that was set up um, in the central gallery of the university uh, called Moving Objects. And it was about histories of displacement and refugee experiences globally that several colleagues of mine across different departments had installed in, uh, in, in UCL's Octagon Gallery. And part of these uh, uh, exhibit, part, part of the, the, the artifacts were Syrian experiences of displacement, part of them were Palestinians uh, experiences of displacement. And among the artifacts that were put in one of the vitrines was uh, Tatriz, a traditional tapestry map of Palestine uh, that was taken from a Jordanian refugee camp uh, to signify the experience of home. And on this uh, map, there was Arabic lettering of different Palestinian cities. And as you would imagine of such an artifact coming from where it did, there was no Hebrew lettering or uh, de delineation of, uh, a, a, of an understanding or a, a, a demarcation of Israel, which would not be surprising given that this was a representation of a lived Palestinian experience of displacement. And the reason uh, this came to my attention is that uh, a student at the university raised a concern about hidden anti-Semitism in the presence of this artifact. And I was asked along with several colleagues to look into this. And of course, we immediately were concerned about the very framing of this idea of hidden anti-Semitism. There was a petition that was organized after the student didn't feel the investigation had been taken seriously. And there was many uh, signatories to this petition claiming that UCL had to get rid of this or had to change the exhibit and had to put up some form of a corrective. And the immediate response from me and from other colleagues was a sense of, uh, you know, a, a pushback that the very idea that in a university space, we suddenly find ourselves 
in the midst of these kinds of arguments about, uh, uh, about anti-Semitism where they have no place in the conversation. And uh, to be asked to look into this and to be asked to look into it without Arab or Palestinian voices participating in that process was a position that elicited for me deep discomfort in a sense that something much broader was at stake here. And at the same time that this was going on, UK uh, government officials were also encouraging and later began demanding that universities adopt the IHRA working definition by Christmas of 2020. Uh, and uh, this was introduced at UCL early on, and many of us on the faculty felt strongly that there were serious concerns, many of them that Brian drew out in his introductory remarks, in the ways in which the IHRA came into conflict with some of the more complex debates, discussions, and uh, uh, topics that we all deal with in the classroom on a regular basis. And so to speak to the kind of origin of some of the politics of these questions, I should say that what transpired brought me back to the early 2000s of my experience as an undergraduate at Columbia in New York at the time, and, and a very toxic atmosphere that some, some of you who are listening or on this panel will know, where uh, around the time of the Second Intifada, there was a great deal of attention and public debate about the role of the teaching of Israel and Palestine at Columbia and uh, the, the specter or the raising of concerns about anti-Semitism as well. And this was often uh, adjudicated through local media and the press, and it created a really uh, damaging and I think destructive learning environment uh, for a lot of us. And this idea that you, you, you go to a university, you're in a space where you're gonna tackle difficult questions and suddenly these accusations are raised uh, ma made for a certain degree of pause and reflection about what is the purpose of the university space? How do we facilitate difficult conversations? How do we learn in a classroom setting? on topics that might uh, be politically problematic without uh, imputing motives or uh, accusing people of anti-Semitism. And that's the kind of context that brought me to think about these questions in the UK. And there's an interesting lineage of how and why some of these questions have now sort of traveled uh, in this direction. And we began working uh, on studying the issue of the IHRA at UCL as part of uh, a working group that I was uh, involved with. And at the same time, in speaking with Jewish students and talking to members of the UCL community, a kind of uh, clear awareness that there were incidents of anti-Semitism that existed and that those incidents, which often uh, were not reported effectively or which were not dealt with by existing UCL policies and procedures, we're not, being, uh, uh, we're not being adjudicated or would not be adjudicated by the imposition of this external working definition. And in fact, uh, in, in the university context, we have rules and regulations, we have equalities law in the UK that should be protecting against groups where anti-Semitism or any form of racism and prejudice uh, it emerges. And so uh, in the process of discussing and, and, and analyzing the, the role of the IHRA, it became clear that we were all in this impossible proposition, that if you were for or against or critical of the IHRA, you were presented as being for or against anti-Semitism. And this is a false and very dangerous narrative uh, that is particularly uh, febrile in, in Europe at the moment and in the UK. And I think what attracted me to the work of the Jerusalem Declaration is that this was a group that understood the political conjuncture, the nature of the need to shift the grounds of conversation and debate by introducing a new text, by thinking a little bit about how to uh, not just fall against the lines of being for or against something, but how might we provide new ways of thinking about some of these questions? And also, how do you do this in a manner that gains some political purchase and traction? Because as we all know, the IHRA had and continues to have its own political traction in these broader debates and discussions. Um, and I think this is the, the context in which the, uh, the JDA entered. And the JDA also very much understood that the way to try and uh, open the conversation and shift the terms of debates emerged from the subject expertise in the field of anti-Semitism studies, Holocaust studies, as well as those working on Israel and Palestine. And so in that sense, I think the effort became very much targeted towards that constituency and community of scholars. Um, and uh, it's also a call very much to bring in a broad base of support. So you'll find many of the signatories on the list 
would position themselves perhaps as liberal Zionists, uh, as some who are non-Zionists, some anti-Zionists, but that the idea was that everybody could agree to a text uh, and put their name to something that would help disentangle some of the ways in which anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism have been unhelpfully conflated. Now, the, the question that you asked is also about, well, where are Palestinian and Arab voices in this conversation? And I think this is a, a preeminent political and ethical question we need to consider because to dislodge the IHRA and its preeminence in these wider political debates uh, is to engage in a, a discussion on the grounds and on the terms as laid out by the IHRA to begin with. And for many of us, myself included, this was an impossible task because entering into the discussion, you found yourself working through the logic of how the IHRA positioned the problem. And so from a scholarly point of view, from a political point of view, it became very difficult to do that kind of disentanglement. But I do think in that context, there is a tactical way of thinking about the need to broaden and change the nature of uh, the discussion and to, uh, uh, and to use the JDA as a tool, as an educational measure to think through some of the problems that the IHRA poses. Now, I do think there needs to be a much broader effort which has continued to unfold and which I think has very much been led by Palestinians and Palestinian civil society. In particular, I think about the work of Palestine Legal, which has been bringing attention to the ways in which the IHRA has been used in uh, an unhelpful and, a, and, and repressive manner when it comes to speech on Palestine. And we can talk about lots of the examples that exist in the US and the UK, elsewhere. Um, and in that context, I think it is part of a broader need to get ourselves out of this false binary that we find ourselves uh, stuck in. Um, and so the JDA in that context, I think is opening up space for debate and discussion without letting things descend into these accusations uh, of anti-Semitism, uh, like what, what I found so distasteful in my own experience uh, at UCL. Um, I think there are many other ways one can go about doing this. I think there are other forms of engagement and intervention. We could think about the context, for example, of the Guardian letter by Palestinian intellectuals and the way in which they engage with the question of anti-Semitism. I think there is a sense and a very, uh, a, a very uh, persuasive sense among many Palestinians that to be implicated in this conversation in its own right brings about a kind of ethical dilemma. Um, how is it that you know every time we're talking about anti-Semitism, suddenly we're talking about Palestine or Israel and Palestine? There's a problem that we have to address as a result of this linkage. Um, what would it be like to do this differently? We could maybe talk about that. I think you could think about different ways we might disentangle some of these questions. But I'm in the context of, of my own engagement and involvement with the JDA, this is one possible avenue to do that. It's not to think about it as a prescriptive tool or as a codifying tool. Um, but it's to think about uh, how this uh, effort and this intervention might help us break some of the stuckness around these broader discussions uh, that have, have unhelpfully entangled uh, the politics of anti-Semitism with Israel and Palestine. Um, so, uh, sorry, Sarah, uh, just before you turn to the next question, I wanted to interject um, and say that um, uh, one of the attendee, Professor Goldberg, wanted to ask to make a correction that uh, there are some signatories to the JDA who are not Jewish, but that doesn't change the kind of the, um, the, um, the, the arguments that you threaded uh, into your response with respect to uh, kind of the border implications and the discourse of the politics of anti-Semitism. <clears throat> All right, thank you. Uh, the next question I'd like to uh, direct to Professor uh, Nadia Abu al -Hajj. Uh, I would like to return to the question raised by uh, Atalia Omer of whose politics do the politics of definition promote and who and what does it attempt to silence? One criticism of the JDA is that it does not confront strongly enough the fact that the deadliest form of anti-Semitism in the world today comes from the right and white supremacists and has little if anything to do with Palestine. Another criticism is that since the JDA is mostly about Palestine, it completely excludes a Palestinian perspective. And as one colleague said, is an example of denying Palestinians permission to narrate. In this regard, what do the politics of defining anti-Semitism mean for Palestinians in Palestine and elsewhere with regard to free speech and the Palestinian national struggle? Thank you. Um, again, I'd like to thank you for inviting me to be part of this. Um, 
So let me try to begin to respond. Sorry, I gotta pull something up. Uh, to those questions. And I, I want to say that in many ways, I think, Seth, the questions, I mean, you did a very good job framing um, uh, uh, some of the responses from Palestinian uh, intellectuals and activists. So it's not clear that I'm going to be saying anything particularly surprising here, but let me lay it out and then hopefully open the discussion. And I will get to, I guess, to the politics of definition in, indirectly. So obviously, the JDA is a massive improvement over the IRA definition. And I say this as someone who is in the US Academy and uh, sees on a daily basis the ways in which that definition is being weaponized, whether officially or unofficially, to shut down all kinds of speech. Um, and I think that the most, some of the most important moves are de-exceptionalizing anti-Semitism and, and placing it squarely uh, within the history of other forms of racism. Um, pulling out the BDS and saying, uh, uh, pulling out both the BDS, highlighting the BDS and highlighting debates about solutions to the uh, current political reality that might include a binational state or a unitary democratic state in the language of the declaration and saying those are not anti-Semitic or a priori anti-Semitic statements. And, and much of the argument in the US goes on around that. Having said that, I'm ambivalent about it and I'm ambivalent about it precisely um, for, for, at, at, through something that probably does get at or is about the politics of def definition, which is what is it that we are focusing on defining and how does that keep the conversation locked into a certain frame? For Palestinians, the question really, I think, is how do we change the entire conversation? Why do we always have to answer the charge? Are we anti-Semitic or not? Even if we end up being exonerated, that charge is always the JDA, in effect, and I am very clear here, was not the intention, keeps the question of anti-Semitism focused on or at least tethered to the question of Palestine, even, a, even as it tries to unravel that, right? It follows the structure of, the, of IRA. And of course, as both Seth and, and um, Brian said, that was the structure of what it was responding to. But I think that there are unintentional consequences of that. Why not clearly and explicitly produce a statement that says that anti-Semitism and the rising forms of violence we're seeing around the world and very strongly in the US are primarily coming from the right as they have historically. That, that would clearly say that the focus on the problem of anti-Semitism as, as it relates to Palestine is not just a matter of weaponizing the charge, but it is a matter of diverting the focus away from where the danger really resides. Given that so much of the document tries to refute the IRA definition, or it's 11 examples, most of it's 11 examples, the document does not in fact effectively place the problem where it needs to be situated. The consequence I think is the very framing of the declaration means that critical speech and activism on Israel and Palestine will continue to be monitored. Is it anti-Semitic or not? For example, even if it is not necessarily anti-Semitic, anti-Zionism can be anti-Semitic, under certain circumstances, that is to quote from the declaration, depending on context, quote, which can include the intention behind the utterance, a pattern of speech over time, or even the identity of the speaker, unquote. So the problem again to restate it is this, the declaration does not challenge the reality of the constant policing and self-policing policing even with regard to Palestinian speech or speech on Palestine, because the specter of that accusation continues to loom. It moves the margins, or it would move the margins if it became, uh, if it could challenge IRA. It would move the margins of what counts as anti Semitic, but it doesn't remove uh, the monitoring. And the real question is why should that question even be asked vis a vis Palestinian or pro Palestinian speech? Moreover, case, how, of course, how does one adjudicate? And quite clearly, how do we know intention? And honestly, I ask this as someone who's been involved in discussions with Facebook of late, the content of which are uh, private, but I mean, only because we were, we were, we have promised to keep that. But the, but the question of they're struggling with when, how to adjudicate when the use of the term Zionist is really a standard for anti-Semitism. And the whole problems of making that decision with a better or worse definition, I think is something one can't get around, right? Um, so why not reframe the entire conversation? For Palestinians, a starting point would be to start with the question of Palestine, the problem of Israel as a settler state, 
and with anti-Palestinian racism. In other words, what racism that is structural and built into the Israeli state, and quite frankly, pretty rampant in the US today. The burden of suspicion has to be lifted. And if not, because if that is not lifted, the cloud of anti-Semitism will always hover over all Palestinian speech and over Palestinians themselves, even if that speech is ultimately deemed, and then the question is by whom, not anti-Semitic. And I just want to uh, end by saying something, a sort of side note, but it's about a specific clause that I think really quite centrally um, will keep this problem and accusation um, alive. And I have no doubt it had to do with the, the problem of, of uh, compromising between people with different politics signing the declaration. But this is my question. So why is the following on the face of it anti-Semitic, which is the category under which it is? Denying the rights of Jews in the state of Israel to exist and flourish collectively and individually as Jews in accordance with the principle of equality, unquote. So let me be clear, I am not saying Israeli Jews, I emphasize here Israeli Jews, do not have rights in, or in, in Israel and Palestine at this moment in time. That is not my position. In any settler nation, rights are gained by settlers over time. And I at least ascribe to that when I think about the future. But more conceptually in a bigger historical frame, all sorts of anti-colonial movements struggled for and insisted on the expulsion of settlers. The French, or the so-called Pied Noir in Algeria, whites in Zimbabwe, the list goes on and on. One might disagree with that as a form of anti-colonial politics, and one might even think it's an obstacle to a solution. But in Zimbabwe or in Algeria, it was not taken to be an index of racism. That claim would certainly not have been self-evident. So again, I ask, why is it self-evidently anti-Semitic? Why is it anti-Semitic on the face of it? Why isn't that, that context or intention dependent? And for me, that's just one example of the ways in which this conversation or this sort of suspicion will continue to hover over uh, critical political speech on Palestine and over Palestinians in particular. I think I'll stop there for now. Thank you. Uh, the um, the next question, I think you've probably in your own way already answered, but I'll ask it anyway. Um, based upon what you've just said then, uh, uh, Professor Abu al Hajj, do you think that the JDA can make a difference um, in any manner, given that so many institutions and governments continue to embrace the uh, IHRA? And more specifically, do you think the JDA as an alternative can adequately address the um, IHRA's conflation of discriminatory and political activities? Um, yeah, I probably have already answered that question. Mm -hmm. I would say two things. In the political reality we're in, would I prefer that the Department of Education use the JDA definition to the IRA definition for monitoring speech on university campuses? Of course I would. But I think it would continue what it, I mean, first of all, let's be clear, no matter what the, no Title IX, is it Title Title VI of the DOE Act has actually won in court, and Palestine legal that Seth um, mentioned has effectively shut down a lot of these challenges. Um, nevertheless, I, I, the JDA would be a better weapon that we could use to fight against it, but the problem would remain, it would not solve the problem of the constant accusations that people teaching on Palestine and Israel or Palestinian scholars making certain kinds of claims or writing certain kinds of things can be taken up on these charges. Because in fact, it, it continues to frame anti-Semitism around this conversation, even as it says it's a misreading of that conversation. So in that sense, I don't know. I mean, I think it really ends up, uh, it could end up perpetuating the problem of what um, Di Mahaldi has called the, right, the free speech, Palestine and the free speech exception, right? That there's an exceptional attention to speech on Palestine here. Um, that has to be adjudicated and is not simply uh, received as free speech in the US Academy. So, you know, I'm wary of trying to go down this road at all. And really that comes from my own personal experience as well as watching it happen with so many other people. 
thank you. Of course, the uh, the worry is that with um, a definition that doesn't uh, at least explicitly claim itself to be legally binding, that it adds kind of a legal bite to a Title VI uh, mode of um, litigation. So um, thank you for your reflection. I now uh, would like to turn to, um, to Lara. Um, and I know that um, um, uh, the question, uh, the, the main question I wanted to ask you, uh, we want to ask you as a start is, really uh, to invite you to reflect on the basis of the, the sustained conversations on IRA that you hosted uh, and the Foundation for Middle East Peace over the past few months, which I tuned into all of them and listened to them multiple times. Um, what are some of the key takeaway points uh, you garner regarding whose politics does the politics of defining and redefining anti-Semitism promote? Um, and um, whose politics it doesn't, or it's silence or downplay. And I know that um, one of the uh, the events that you hosted uh, uh, brought together um, uh, the kind of uh, reflections and interventions from um, Jews of color. Jews of color. So this is kind of an interesting dimension to to bring in. So just want you to reflect. Um, kind of synthetically on the kind of conversations that you've been hosting and also to what degree you see JDA intervening uh, in the discourse. Thank you. Thank you for the question and thank you so much um, all of the, all the organizers of this event. I think it's been an already an, an enormously rich conversation. Um, I, I come into this conversation um, from a very different perspective. I'm not part of the academy. I'm, I'm very much of a practitioner and I just as a little background got sort of sucked into the debate around the IRA definition really starting back in 2010 when the State Department first adopted what was then the precursor to the IRA definition, which looked a lot like the IRA definition. Um, and at the time looking at it and kind of thinking, well, this is kind of weird, but it's not good. And then sitting down and talking with a colleague at an Arab American organization who said, you need to pay really close attention to this particular piece of the wording because it is going to be weaponized um, against Palestinian voices, against um, the activists for Palestinian rights, and probably eventually against um, American or Jewish Americans who, who are critical of Israel. Um, and, and she was absolutely right. And I've really been, been tracking this ever since where this really came to a head, I think, for a lot of um, Jewish Americans who maybe had been blissfully unaware of this, even if Palestinian Americans um, and, and Palestinian advocates had, had been watching this closely, was with the advent of the Trump era, and particularly the adoption of the executive order on anti-Semitism, which, which put the IRA definition effectively gave it the force of law in, in, in certain ways. Um, and that was accompanied, I should say, by, by bipartisan support, including from, from um, a gentleman named Ted Deutsch, who, who is the chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee. Essentially, he, he wrote an article in the Times of Israel right around the time, just before um, Trump uh, issued his executive order. Um, Deutsch had an article basically making the case that the IRA definition should be adopted across the whole of US government as a definition that would be you know, grounded in law and applying across the board. So this wasn't just a Trump thing and it wasn't somehow just partisan. Um, you know, the, the conversations that we've hosted over the past few months around the IRA definition, all of which were before the JDA became public and before the other definition, the Nexus definition was also released, were really trying to sort of uh, socialize in a broader way for people what the IRA definition is and why it, it is problematic. And, and there's, you know, I've been having debates on, on Twitter with, with a lot of folks that people in, in this webinar probably know about words like weaponize, um, instrumentalize. And some of that has to do with the discomfort about attributing intent. And I, I don't know the drafters of the IRA definition personally. I, I, I've gotten to know Kenneth Stern. I know his view. But I mean, the bottom line for me at this point is it doesn't matter what the intention was when it was drafted. The intentions of, uh, of the sort of core effort around promoting it are very clear. And, and they're clearer today than maybe they even were before the JDA because the response to the JDA has been very clarifying. And, and the intention around the IRA definition is to essentially marginalize all the normal, the old anti-Semitism. Don't worry about that. We all are familiar with it. We'll put that aside and really shift all focus and, and, and all urgency around fighting this new anti-Semitism, which is entirely about delegitimizing quashing, possible criminalizing criticism uh, of Israel, criticism of Israeli policies, uh, the, the political view it is anti-Zionism. And, and what's really come through, I mean, on the one hand, I think there is 
um, you know, there's the bad news, which was pre-JDA, which was nobody was really, there, there was no one contesting the space in any effective way against the IRA definition, except the activist class, right? And there are articles being written in Palestinian voices and, and it really hadn't broken through. Um, we had a little shift with the Trump era and a, I think a growing realization amongst progressive Jewish Americans that this might come and bite them in the butt too. And it's a shame that, you know, it takes the, it, for a lot of people, I think it, it took the, oh my God, this might affect me before they developed some empathy for the people it was already affecting. I think that's quite regrettable and people should do some soul searching on that. Um, but regardless, there has been this realization that, you know, implementing a definition that effectively says that if not just if you're, you know, someone who is anti-Zionist and, and the idea that being anti-Zionist is definitionally anti-Semitic is really quite striking. It's essentially saying, I, I, I was on another webinar where someone said, well, but Zionism is the national movement of the Jewish people. And I said, you know, you need to read your history. Zionism is a national movement of some Jewish people. Not all Jewish people were on board with Zionism when it was first promoted, not all Jewish people are on board with the establishment of the state of Israel, and not all Jewish people support the state of Israel today or see themselves as Zionists. So essentially you're saying that if you don't support Zionism, you're not Jewish, and Jewish people are saying, no, that's not true. Um, the JDA has, I think, um, be coming into this discourse, and we've actually sort of suspended our IRA events for now to try to see how this takes shape, because it's, it's really interesting what, what the you know, I think there, this, the, the, the previous speakers have talked about some of the, the challenges and weaknesses around the JDA, both in terms of, um, I think, obviously the question of Palestinian input. I think a lot of the Palestinian voices we've had on our webinars have also been outspoken in saying there should have been Palestinian engagement on this. It's, it's, we, they are the people who are the most affected. They are the, the, the people who are at, facing the tip of the spear. Um, and, and there's, I think the uh, Professor Abel Hajj comments about, you know, this, this sort of perpetuates, and Seth as well, this sort of perpetuates the IRA framing. It, it is problematic. From a practitioner perspective, though, having these other definitions out there to, to contest the space and challenge the, the, the statement that there is universal acceptance around IRA and it's only marginal, these, these outliers who disagree with it. Um, is incredibly important. Um, and the fact that, you know, when I think, I think it may have been Seth or may have been Brian, that, that if you look at the, where the JDA came out of, the sort of signatories that it has coming out of essentially the core of experts on anti-Semitism, Holocaust, all of that, you have a document which right now is being attacked almost every day. I, I track all the articles. There's almost every day one or two articles attacking it, essentially claiming that the people who signed it are all anti-Semites and defenders of anti-Semitism. And, and you know, all, it, it's, it's really quite clarifying. There is no way to, 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 to come at this except to delegitimize the very voices who would say anti-Semitism is a terrible problem. We should focus on it. And IRA is not about anti-Semitism, it's about criticism of Israel. You, you have to delegitimize even that train of thought because you can't challenge it otherwise. So, I mean, the, you know, we've had some really interesting conversations. The, the webinar that we had focused on, on Jews of color was amazing. I mean, for me, I learned an enormous amount. I hope people will watch it. One of the things that comes out of that kind of conversation, you know, the Jewish community has a lot of, um, a, a lot of soul searching to do about how it's dealing with anti-Semitism in general, but also how it's dealing with the various forms of racism, discrimination within its own community, the failure to defend members of the Jewish community, largely when Israel is involved. Um, and this, you sort of find at that point, the, the, the people who are the most vulnerable, the most exposed and the least defended here are Jews of color. And anyone who is on social media who has seen the vicious attacks against Jews of color who come out in any way critical of Israel, um, it's, it, it really reflects what appears to be an almost overt racism, right? We don't really consider you Jewish because you're, you're people of color, but we'll tolerate you being Jewish so long as you line up behind a greater Israel Zionist agenda. The minute you move away from that, you are, you, you, you're beyond the pale. And you know, and that's a beyond the pale that goes 
further beyond the pale than, than someone say like me, who is you know, Ashkenazi Jewish to the core and critical of Israel. So you can, you, know, you can dislike me, you can call me a self-hating Jew, an anti-Semitic Jew, I've been called all of those things. It's a little harder um, within, I'm not as exposed as Jews of colors are to absolute outright denial of, of my identity and my right um, to speak as a Jew and criticize Israel as a Jew. Thank you, Lara. And uh, my next question is to you, uh, still with you, is um, still very much on that same level of analysis um, and relates back to kind of the framing of the session uh, that I articulated um, earlier. So we've seen, um, as other people also commented, upsurge of white supremacist attacks that include in the, in the US and elsewhere that include, um, but are not restricted to, to Jews. And this is really important. Um, and uh, this has been clear from Charlottesville to Pittsburgh to a man wearing um, a six million people were not enough sweater and in the uh, January 6 uh, insurrection uh, in the US. Um, and also in, uh, interestingly in that same context we see kind of an occasional Israeli flags also um, um, kind of scatter across the, uh, um, the, the, the crowds. Um, so do you believe um, that the politics of anti-Semitism put Jews at risk by differentiating anti-Semitism from other hatreds and forms of racism? Should we reconsider the need uh, of an exclusivist definition of anti-Semitism? So um, I, I think we already have on the table some reflections on this question of why have a separate definition, but um, I'm really curious to hear from you um, about this um, uh, point. Thanks. And, and that, that really does sort of get to the heart of the question for a lot of um, Jewish Americans, really, wherever you fall in the political spectrum. Um, I, I really, I, I believe that that separating out anti-Semitism from every other form of hatred and racism. I think when you start sort of stove piping this and creating special protections one by one, well, I think, A, you actually create more problems for the for this this new exempted special category and i think you're also essentially admitting that you have failed to protect ha have broad enough protections for everyone because if you really are protect if you really are fighting racism hatred discrimination all of that if you have good laws in that then you you don't need special special exemptions for anybody you don't need a special definition um, beyond that the you going back to the beginning of your question you know with the white supremacy and violence and all that's happening, you know, it is um, it, it is baffling, um, and I, I would say it sounds judgmental. I would say it's unconscionable that at this moment in time we have the energies around combating anti-Semitism are not aimed at the kind of anti-Semitism, actual anti-Semitism, the stuff that's actually threatening the lives of Jews, the stuff that means that we need armed guards at synagogues. You know, the, immediately after the Pittsburgh massacre where Jews were, were the worst anti-Semitic attack in my lifetime. I mean, it, it, immediately after that, there was efforts, we saw immediate efforts, people saying, members of Congress saying, see, we have to pass the Anti-Semitism Awareness Act. That's great. The Anti-Semitism Awareness Act is about quashing criticism of Israel. It's not about going after white supremacists who buy into, you know, neo-Nazi, you know, old school Jews rule the world, you know, refugee, the, the stuff that actually was, was at play there. I mean, it, it, is, it is just, it's extraordinary. And, and the, the other side of that coin, you know, I, I will point at, uh, there was a, uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene, who is the member of Congress who had the space lasers and all that is pretty, pretty open in, in her association um, with those who seem to support anti-Semitism in, in rather virulent ways. Um, she, she's now positioning herself in Congress as the great protector of Israel against the terrible Democrats. Um, I mean, you, you have this absolute bizarre situation, which again, we saw throughout the Trump era, where the opposite of you know fighting anti-Semitism is the, the 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 calculus has shifted from you know the opposite of anti-Semitism is ending anti-Semitism to the opposite of anti-Semitism is embracing philo-Semitism, where you fetishize Judaism and Israel and you put them on this fetishized pedestal. And anyone who doesn't buy into that is part of the problem. And anyone who supports that philo-Semitism is a-okay even if they buy into the oldest, most vile anti-Semitic tropes. 
And by the way, it has been an enormously effective way for um, the most illiberal forces in American society to effectively take the most vulnerable and most courageous progressive voices who are overwhelmingly people of color, women of color, and some Muslims of color um, in the political sector and, and, and try to make them absolutely radioactive. Um, again, in terms of who is being, being hurt the most. Uh, we just had the J Street conference last weekend and you know Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders can go to the J Street conference and talk about you know putting more pressure on Israel, potentially conditioning aid, whatever. Ilhan Omar says any word about the Middle East and she is you know, attacked as an anti-Semite. Rashida Tlaib says anything. They, they can articulate things that could come out of the mouth of a Peace Now activist and it would be nothing, but they say it. And, and, and the Democratic Party, the progressives have, have really not, you know, have, have, very, have done a very poor job pushing back on this. And fundamentally them doing a poor job pushing back on this comes back to them adopting, again, as practitioners, adopting this IRA style framework, which absolutely conflates criticism of Israel anti-Semitism and turns it into a weapon to be used to shut down those voices. Thank you. And I um, should add that Marjorie Green uh, is also, also declared um, uh, an aspiration to create an Anglo-Saxon white caucus, um, the same person who spoke. I just, for, for those uh, perhaps in the audience who are not aware of this like, um, anti-Semitic kind of trope uh, that played into her declaration that the uh, fires in California were, um, uh, what is it exactly, uh, started because of some Jewish space laser. Um, so just to highlight the connections between white supremacy um, and um, 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 racism, ex exclusionary politics, nationalist politics in various contexts. I mean, the US is one, but we have Hungary, we have other places, France, um, and, um, and how the kind of that, that fetishization um, of, of, of Israel plays into this um, kind of discourses that are about you know, the, um, the US or, or um, other places that are very localized. At this point, I would like to invite everybody uh, perhaps to uh, turn on um, uh, your camera so that we'll, have, uh, we'll open up the conversation uh, if, um, uh, if you're willing um, and invite whoever wants to kind of jump in on that, the same question that I posed to um, Lara uh, or any other kind of thread that you want to pick on uh, with respect to, um, so, so the, the specific question to Lara was uh, to what degree uh, um, actually um, uh, anti-Semitism put Jews at risk by differentiating anti-Semitism from other hatreds and forms of racism, uh, the uh, kind of the analysis of um, a white supremacy or um, other, uh, again, other threads that are in the conversation before we, uh, we move to the next, um, uh, the next round of questions. Who wants to jump in? I'll just add, I'm sorry, very quickly. And this is speaking as a Jewish American. I, you know, I, I was raised by, you know, progressive Jewish parents. And I was raised very much to believe, and this was so obvious that it barely needed to be said. Unless rights are protected for everyone, they're protected for no one. And that, that Jews' vulnerability as a minority led us to understand that, whether you're talking about free speech or freedom of religion, freedom of worship, it, it, is, um, it is really striking to me to reach this age in my life and find that whole framing, which was so fundamental to progressive Jewish identity in the United States, just turned on its head. Um, it, it really seems to you know, be buying into a much more illiberal tribalist approach, which says we're, we, we can only be interested in ourselves first. And, and you know, other people, you know, it, it, it's, it's very tribalist and, and, and very re regressive. I wasn't sure whether you were inviting everyone at the seminar or whether it was addressed, your, your invitation was addressed to the panel. Oh, um, yeah, uh, I, I mean, to the, to the panel, everyone on the panel. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I, I, I would, um, first of all, let me just quickly say that my experience is very much the same as Lara's in terms of growing up. Um, and that's a whole conversation that could be had, I think, in its own right. But I do want to get back to um, Nadia's critique because I think it was a very incisive critique. Um, and much of what you said, Nadia, I can't really disagree with, but what I would, say 
is that the very things that you're pointing out as weaknesses in the JDA looked at from another angle are its strengths. And this is the problem that I think we find ourselves caught in a way between a rock and a hard place. Do we try to put the IHRA definition to one side and reset, as it were, the parameters of um, a public statement about anti-Semitism, or do we engage it head on? Because we couldn't do both in a document that would be brief enough um, to be a viable candidate uh, to offer parties in the, in the, in the public um, as an alternative to the IHRA. And here I think the ground has been laid for what I want to say, both by, by Seth and by Lara. Um, uh, Lara really laid it out fairly um, clearly by bringing in this term, the new anti-Semitism. I mean, the question is, to go back to the question of whether or not there should be a special definition for anti-Semitism. Where do you begin with this? I mean, one, one place to begin is to ask the question, what is a definition? And a definition, I think, uh, is a form of words that is intended to clarify a concept. And if that's a definition, then the IHRA definition, by definition, is not a definition. Then what is it? It's an instrument that's being used. Whatever the intentions, to go back to a point you made, Lara, and I agree, whatever the intentions of the original drafters of the IHRA document, which calls itself a definition, it actually functions as an instrument to promote the politics of the so-called new anti-Semitism. And this is a politics that has been around now for quite a long time, and some of us have written critically about it for over 20 years, I think. But it is a politics that redirects, refocuses the whole question of anti-Semitism today precisely on the area that, Nadia, you are challenging, and I, and I agree with you, <laughs> namely, um, on the arena of Palestine and Israel and Zionism. And to give you an idea of what we're up against, let me just, if I may, share with you all, I don't know how to share these things on screen, so I'll have to hold it up to the camera. This is a document that's called Handbook for the Practical Use of the IHRA Working Definition of Anti-Semitism. This is the document. It's been produced by the European Commission in conjunction with the IHRA, um, it came out fairly recently, a few weeks ago. It's about 48 pages long, um, which leads me to think that they have begun to realize uh, how much their document is in need of clarification. But let me quote you this sentence as an example of a clarification. It concerns um, the um, so-called example seven in the IHRA definition, which is one of the most contentious. Um, denying the Jewish people is meant to be an example of anti-Semitism, depending on context, they say. Denying the Jewish people their right to self-determination, for example, by claiming that the existence of a state of Israel is a racist endeavor. And the commentary on that in this handbook, and I'll read it out to you, is this. Denying the Jewish people the right to self-determination and a national homeland is anti-Semitic. Doesn't say anything about context. Is anti-Semitic because it denies the religious and historic ties of Jews to the land of Israel. Well, that's new anti-Semitism in a nutshell. And that is in a document that's been produced by the European Commission to advance the IHRA definition. That's what we're up against. The extent to which this idea has somehow insinuated itself, even into documents that are produced by a body like the European Commission. Um, and now I know in the United States, there is a, a debate going on about uh, the appointment of, of a of an anti-Semitism sar in effect by Joe Biden's government. Presumably the momentum of what I call a runaway train will continue unless, and this was our conundrum, unless we can find a way of stopping it. And we felt for what it's worth and maybe our judgment is wrong, that the only way to stop it is to fasten on the very thing in it that is causing the most trouble. And that is the whole sort of um, uh, concept of the new anti-Semitism, which turns, to put it very crudely, very roughly, anti-Zionism into anti-Semitism. So we've taken pains in this document to separate those two things out, to dismantle that conjunction, uh, and to put forward a document which could be signed and endorsed 
by people with a whole spectrum of political views concerning Zionism, Palestine, and Israel. I don't think we could have done that without adopting the structure that we did adopt. And this is where you may well disagree and I could be wrong and we maybe were wrong. But I want to leave this with going back to a point that Seth made, which I think is worth bearing in mind. It's not only a question of what we're up against, it's also a question of what we are or are not preventing. I think that our initiative doesn't exclude others. And as a matter of fact, I think as Seth put it, it opens the door to others precisely by posing a serious challenge to the IHRA definition and the underlying, the subtext, the underlying premise, which is basically that of the so-called new anti-Semitism, conflating anti-Zionism with anti-Semitism. I think it does open that door. And I, for one, would welcome other initiatives. I think that the, I can't answer some of the criticisms you've made because I think they're valid. You know, I think there's a serious problem with the way in which this initiative seems to continue a kind of focus on not only Palestine and Israel, but also the very fact that it, 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 it comes from mainly Jewish sources. And I take the point that um, was made by someone in the audience. It's true, of course, amongst the signatories and indeed amongst the drafters, there were people who were not Jewish, but overwhelmingly it is, primarily it is an initiative that comes from voices that identify as Jewish, that are identified as Jewish, and that carry a certain sort of authority because of their scholarship and their position, because it needed to say this so-called new anti-Semitism, which the IHRA definition is being used to promote, does not speak for jury collectively. It speaks for some people, but it doesn't speak for us collectively. And I don't know how we could have done that without having the focus that we had. And I regret the collateral damage, which I think there is, but I also think there, might, there are ways of addressing that damage and rectifying it, going beyond the JDA, you know, because in the end, what are these definitions? People are looking for answers in definitions. Definitions have a very limited use. And the, the truth is that one of the purposes served by ours, I believe, by the JDA, first of all, is that it's not a definition, it's a declaration. And within that declaration, there is a short definition. But much of the work of the document lies elsewhere. It lies in the preamble and it lies in the guidelines and the purpose is educational. And the intention is to open up the debate and to open people's minds, which currently are being closed down because there's only this runaway train. There's only this juggernaut and people are intimidated by it and therefore unable to address the, the larger Issue. So I want to end by appealing to people in the audience who, who feel, who share the, the, the sort of worries about the JDA and the criticisms of the JDA that have been voiced here very clearly and very, I think, effectively, um, especially by Nadia. I want to say to you, don't treat this JDA as though it's intended to be the last word. It's intended to be the first word. You know, it, it's, it's not meant to be finishing a finishing document, it's meant to be a document that, as Seth puts it, opens up, opens the door to further push back against the politics of the def of defining anti-Semitism that you see with the IHRA. Thank you for this important uh, clarification um, and um, kind of restating that uh, critical point about opening, what how the JDA participates uh, uh, and seeks to open up uh, the, the conversation um, and um, um, and one kind of like the, uh, one of the big questions that we that we wanted to pose to you and I'll start with uh, Nadia uh, responding to is to what degree uh, is it's forever impossible to disentangle anti-Semitism uh, from the question of Palestine Israel and uh, the politics of a particular nation state so it's a different way of asking the question that uh, we. Uh, we posed to, to Lara about uh, why anti-Semitism needs its own definition outside of kind of the anti-racist uh, discourse. So, um, uh, and, and I would, I would like to invite everybody to respond to it, but maybe uh, we'll start with, with you, Nadia. Okay, um, so 
if I can just briefly say a couple things, Brian, to what you said, which are not unrelated. I want to be clear. I may be an outlier on this, but I don't actually have problems with it being a document that was primarily uh, signed, I mean, by the vast majority, um, by, uh, by people who self-identify as Jewish. I have for decades been thinking, I can't be the one that keeps saying this is an anti-Semitic. I, there needs to be a public voice among Jewish intellectuals and activists and others that fight that battle because I have no credibility saying that. So in fact, my issue is much more with the frame than with the process and the signatories. I also recognize one's caught in a rock and a hard place here. I, I totally get that. I just also just really fear, and this may get to the Israel and Palestine sense, we have to change the conversation. And it just seems to me that one can change the conversation a little bit by saying the IRA definition is ridiculous and I'm gonna tell you where they're wrong specifically. But I think one also just has to redirect attention, which is what I think is it, like the document could have also said, okay, let me give you some examples of what of the rise of anti-Semitism and the rise of white supremacy are incredibly entangled again. And there are these enormous instances of this that nobody is paying attention to. Let's pay attention to this, right? And I think without doing that, the frame just continues with, can you ever separate this conversation about anti-Semitism, or you're calling the new anti-Semitism, which I think is right, from Israel, from, from, from it being tethered to the struggle over Palestine. And until that is severed, I just, I, I feel like, we are caught between a rock and a hard place, right? I mean, as my daughter came home from high school the other day and said, mom, I'm you now. I was called an anti-Semite for the first time. I mean, it's like, it's just, imp and these are kids who don't know anything. That's just their need your go-to, right? Um, so in that sense of what it means to stop us being answerable to that charge all the time, I think has to really not just try to navigate around the edges. And I don't mean these are insignificant edges, they're important edges, but to actually say, let's pay attention to where this risk really is. And this risk is part of this much long, larger shift to the right, where racism, you know, it's not the same for all different groups, but it, I mean, in, even in terms of intensity or what it means, you know, black men being shot almost every day in this country, um, but that it that's the alliance, right? And we have to think about this in the same political framework. Because without that, we're just gonna keep arguing this. And you know, maybe it'll move little by little, but the question of Palestine is not gonna escape that being the first question asked and the first thing we have to answer to. And I just don't see an exit if we're arguing or debating details, because we're still monitoring the speech. Right. Even though that's a clearly the JD does not want to be monitoring speech, but if it were adopted, it would still monitor speech. Right. Um, can I just can I just come in here because I I agree with Nadia with your frustration and with what I think is the broader point about thinking about anti racist politics and how do we how do the politics of definitions actually trap us? Because then you become embedded in this whole Olympics of suffering and who do we focus on and how do we play this? And if there's a definition of anti-Semitism, there should be a definition for anti-Palestinian racism. And this has already come up in my own institution and where does anti-Black racism fit in? And it becomes uh, absurd at the end of the day because actually there should be a broad-based struggle that we can wage in thinking about racism and prejudice. And doesn't mean we have to undermine the particularities of different forms of racism and the particularities of anti-Semitism, it's that we can understand that it also is always changing. What anti-Semitism means today in 2021 is different than what it meant in the 1980s, in the 1990s, or in the 1940s. And that conjunctural moment or reality, as a historian would always point out, is why if you look behind Brian's shelf and you asked him to pull off the books on anti-Semitism, he'd probably pull 75 from the top two because it's an ongoing debate that's been happening for decades by scholars about how we understand and whether we should even try and define anti-Semitism if we listen to David Engel's very important critique. Given that reality and given that conjunctural moment, we also have to contend with the fact, and here I'm very attentive to the critiques of the Israeli 
philosopher Yeshayahu Leibovitz, who talked about what happens when you have the nationalization of Judaism. And this is something you cannot simply disentangle with the snap of your fingers. This is a reality and, 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 and a circumstance that we are living with in the post-48 moment, that the attainment of power and sovereignty by Jews as a collective in a way that goes against the historical experience of powerlessness. And this is where, you know, the historian David Beale writes this really remarkable book on power and powerlessness in Jewish history in the wake of the 1982 Lebanon war, when the critiques of overreach reach this fever pitch and in many ways resonate with our current moment because of the way people talk and invoke anti-Semitism, the accusation of the blood libel, the pogrom and the way that the Israeli government is critiqued and attacked. I should say that Benjamin Netanyahu at the time is the ambassador's assistant or working in the UN uh, and it gets his political education in the aftermath of the Israeli invasion. So that entanglement of nationalism and Judaism and the way in which we are forced to contend with its implications is not going away. You can call it the new anti-Semitism, you can call it something else, but I don't think the JDA is gonna solve it. I don't think any of this is going to resolve it. I actually think it's a symptom of the fact that this is the teleological endpoint of that kind of entanglement. And here we are living a particular moment where this is only going to get worse before there is some resolution to the question. It's why the accusation of apartheid, for example, becomes this explosive moment. We were there in the 70s with Zionism as racism at the UN. So it's, I think, a recurrence with a different kind of fevered pitch because some of the assumptions and the linkages that had been made in earlier decades are now questioned and critiqued so effectively and so powerfully that there is a kind of uh, uh, anxiety and a resistance to the disentanglement of these ideas. And so I'd love to not be in a space where we're talking about this. I didn't wanna be spending my last year thinking about these questions, working on the JDA, thinking about the implications of the UCL at UCL. But in a sense, this is a, a circumstance that is in, in existence. I mean, this is the reality of the political conjunction. And one other thing I'd say on that you know, I'm listening and I'm thinking about the American context, but the story doesn't come only out of the United States. I mean, we cannot uh, overstate the way in which the transnational dimensions of this conversation have made it so complex. How does the IHRA get received in the US, whether in the Trump context or what comes after is one question, but the same if you turn to Germany and the same if you turn to the UK where I teach. These debates are latching on to a whole host of other political questions that have kind of captured the imagination and, and, and the question of identity politics. So in the UK, it's about you know, the, the aftermath of the psychodramas around the Labour Party and Corbyn. That's the context in which you're entering this conversation. In Germany, it's a different one. So how do you shift that? How do you open up the space? How do you allow for a different kind of discussion to unfold? And I think we're all stuck in the fact that it's really complicated and toxic, but it's also the case that we're dealing with realities uh, on the ground that are you know, happening all the time. I mean, we, we don't have to go through the examples of all the ways in which uh, the, 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 the silencing or the self-silencing has functioned, but I, I don't think we can lose sight of the fact that it all emerges in a particular moment in time. Mm. Lara, you wanted to jump in? Just to add to that, and again, this is the practitioner in me, the, the particular moment in time, I think the part that's, that's, that, that isn't being mentioned here, and maybe it's, it's so obvious, that, but I think it needs to be mentioned. You know, this effort to redefine and, and really officially, in a way that we'd never done before, see an official formal conflation of criticism of Israel and anti-Semitism, which wasn't something new, right? The 70s, the 80s, this was, this was something you heard, but it wasn't so formalized. This is very much, when I look at the timeline here, it, it goes along with the shift in politics on the ground in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict away from any notion, any serious notion that this would be resolved in a peaceful way. And the shift in the idea that if you were going to support Israel, it means you support greater Israel. And the sort of zero tolerance if there had been a period of tolerance that started around the, with the beginning of the Oslo process, which basically led to a, a worldwide legitimization of Palestinian organizations, of Palestinian voices, of Palestinian narratives in a way that was very healthy and that spoke of a glide path to some sort of negotiated solution where both peoples lived in peace, blah, blah, blah. 
you know, by 2010, we were far from that. We were well into the, the, the BB era and the outright embrace by the Israeli government of a, a, a binary, you know, one side wins, one side loses, we're the winners. And the only way to justify that is with the wholesale delegitimization of the Palestine cause. And, and the reason why I think it's important to recognize that is that isn't going away. That's getting worse on the ground. While we're struggling here with this intellectual exercise of trying to properly define what it means, what anti-Semitism means, the limits of free speech, all of that, the right way to protect voices, on the ground, the situation is moving deeper into this, this black and white zero sum um, framework. Um, and that is going to pose a terrible challenge to this effort because there isn't room to compromise. If your worldview says I need to find a way to I need to find to find a way to defend Israel, maintaining permanent dominion over millions of people who aren't citizens and possibly looking to start expelling them after decades of, of giving priority to the rights of people who are Jewish over the rights of these people, but I talked about peace. No, now it's just straight up, you know superiority. This is Jewish supremacy, which is the language that's now being used when we talk about apartheid. There is no gray area to accommodate this common, this conversation of anti-Semitism. So we're going to have it in the US and we're going to have it in Europe and maybe in the Israeli peace camp. Um, but, but the fact is the politics on the ground are moving in a direction that has no space for this at all. Anybody, yeah. would anybody else like to comment before we turn to the questions? Okay, then. Um, there are many, many questions. And as I said in my opening remarks, I apologize in advance for not being able to get to all of them. We have literally four minutes left. Um, I will start with this one. Uh, the questioner asks, can political speech be both legitimate and anti-Semitic? I ask because while I want the law in America to protect, to protect anti-Semitic speech as speech, so long as it does not incite violence. I also want to be able to point out someone's anti-Semitism or argue about it. Look, I think here, partly this is a differentiation between campus issues and free speech on campus and, and free speech more generally. And I, am, I, I think it'd be great to have someone from the ACLU weigh in on this. The bottom line is under US law, it's not illegal to be an asshole. It's not, in, it's not illegal to be hateful. Um, I think this, the, the, this question of, you know, if you can define it to fight it, which is the language that's used by, I think that's the, the, the actual hashtag for the Lawfare Project's efforts behind the IHRA definition. The idea here is that we will define it and then we will go and use every possible lever in court and try to get laws passed. And that's where this gets really dicey. Um, but it gets dicey before that. So for example, we have the question of, you know, Arizona last year trying to add the IHRA definition to their, their hate speech, their hate crimes legislation, which is pretty clear that that is a terrifying prospect. If you are arrested for trespassing in a demonstration, I mean, this didn't pass into law, but it, this is what, would, what it would mean. You're carrying a Palestinian flag and someone says, ah, that's now hates, it's now a hate crime. So you'll get a, a, an extra sentencing because you committed a crime. But the carrying the flag itself isn't a crime, so you, so it's you know the argument would be it's not a problem. But if you look at going back to to Brian, you know, holding up that report for the EU, NGO Monitor issued a report right after that, explaining, okay, here's how you operationalize the IHRA definition. And NGO Monitor, in effect, is arguing things like, well, you know, okay, fine, you don't have to. Facebook doesn't have to adopt the IRA definition because people are afraid of free speech. So instead, they can just put warning labels on criticism of Israel saying it's, it's under the IRA definition, this is anti-Semitic. So, you know, how does that play in terms of quashing free speech? We'll just say you're an anti-Semite every time you post an article from Haaretz on Facebook. Uh, the implications of going down this road go beyond actually just the outright criminalizing of speech. And, 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 and it's a much, it's much dicier than that. Okay. Um, I guess yeah, if I could, oh, sorry, please. I might just follow up on campuses. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I think that's absolutely right. I mean, so as I mentioned before, I mean, again, private universities and the relationship to first free speech is very different, but, and this is a very US conversation, obviously Germany has a very different position on certain kinds of speech, but, you know, this group Palestine Legal has won every, every case of accusation, you know, against uh, students for justice in Palestine, et cetera, 
on the grounds of being anti-Semitic has, has really been thrown out of court before it got there, not because it was adjudicated not to be anti-Semitic, but on sort of free speech grounds. But that does not change the climate, right? I think that's the issue. There's the canary mission that like follows people and posts. And, you know, for someone like me at this point, it's irritating, but it doesn't really matter. But students who are going on the job market, if you Google them, you're gonna find the accusation that they're anti-Semitic. So it has a function of intimidation, the accusation regardless of its legal standing. And I actually think that this campaign is much more about that in the US and particularly on college campuses than really believing that one is gonna win the legal cases and shut down certain kinds of speech. I think it's actually a coordinated harassment campaign and, and it has its effects. I mean, um, and it has its effects on lots of people who won't even enter the conversation, not because they don't agree, but, but they think, why would I wade into this? It's just gonna get me in trouble, right? So I think one has to think about this more as a harassment campaign than uh, a legal one, even though it often uses uh, the judiciary as its entree. Uh, Italia, would you like to wrap up since we're out of time? Yeah, uh, well, first of all, um, thank you so much for all the um, uh, the important insights and interventions and uh, and those important important distinctions, in particular in the, the last two responses between the issue of harassment, uh, and how it plays out on that the, um, uh, register of free speech, that politics of, of definitions and, and, uh, and rather politics of defining. So uh, uh, we use the concept of defining because it illuminates the, you know, that there is um, a strategy uh, behind it. Uh, but, but also um, uh, there is the, what, what uh, Lara uh, really highlighted is the issue of the, um, the, the actual realities on the, on the ground and, the, and those who are affected uh, uh, the most by this politics of defining. And we tried in this panel, in this conversation, and hopefully, uh, unfortunately, this conversation will, will have to continue um, uh, because of many of the points that we raised um, to, to really highlight uh, and bring into, um, uh, uh, to, to highlight, highlight those tensions and, and really foreground, in my view, and I feel this is kind of my own positionality and, and responsibility as an Israeli um, Jewish academic working in the US, um, the issue of, uh, you know, what are the implications on the ground, not only uh, Zionism, not only Israel, it's greater Israel, um, and this, uh, how, how the discourse of Jewish supremacy also plays into it. So with this, we'll conclude. Thank you so much for everybody, for your time and your attention. Um, thank you all. It was an excellent conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.